الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him As He ought to be praised and glorified And we pray for peace and for blessings On all His noble messengers And in particular on the last of them all The blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam I greet you My brothers and sisters tonight With assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh When I was a young man in the springtime of my life I became a school teacher at the age of about 18 and now in the winter of my life I'm now 75 I've become a fisherman a big fisherman I'm fishing fishing for students Fishing for those who have a thirst in their hearts for knowledge. Knowledge that comes from Allah, not from UWI. <laughs> I'm fishing for those who will devote their lives to the pursuit of knowledge. My name is not important. When I am gone from this world, all you do is make dua for me. My name is not important. The knowledge is important. The battle must go on. One come and one goes. And so in the winter of my life, I'm searching for students. <laughs> who will tomorrow become scholars of Islam. A good teacher wants a student who will rise higher than him. And so I, learn, I look for and I long for serious students, men with backbone who will stand up for the truth regardless of the price they have to pay. I mean, The Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam was passing by and some of his companions were sitting and talking amongst themselves and he asked, what are you talking about? The hadith is in Sahih Muslim and they said we are talking about the signs of the last day alamatu sa'a we have an egyptian with us here tonight his mother tongue is arabic alamatu sa'a the signs of the hour and then he said the last hour will not come until and he mentioned 10 These are known as the ten major signs. In addition to these, there are many, many, many more. They are number one, and they are not given in the chronological order in which they will occur. Number one is uh, the return of the son of Mary. Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Number two is that before he returns there is someone who will try to impersonate him 
and declare that he is the Messiah al Masih, but he would not be. He would be the false Messiah. He is Dajjal. Number three, Gog and Magog. Number four, Dukhan, smoke. So much you can't see the sunlight. Number five, Dabbatul Ab, a beast or creature of the land, the earth. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Number seven, eight, and nine, three earthquakes, three khusuf, plural of khas, a sinking of the earth. The earth sinks and swallows what it swallows, one in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. And number 10, that a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of hasha, of judgment, of assembly. These are known as the 10 major signs. Some of these are mentioned in the Quran. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ سُورَةُ سُورَةُ الْأَعْرَفِ وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ بَعْدَ أُوزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Many times you are reciting the Qur'an for the first time, you always say, بَعْدَ أُوزُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And then you recite from the Qur'an. For the rest of the lecture, you don't have to do it. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ And your Lord has announced, has declared, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لِيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ But Allah is now going to raise against them, against them. إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوعَ الْعَذَابِ Those who will inflict upon them until the last day the worst possible punishment. So from the time of the revelation of the Quran until the end of time, the end, the end, the end of the world, there are forces in the world which have been released by Allah and which are inflicting terrible punishment. What are they? Who are they who can live that long? Hmm? They are, of course, al Masihud Dajjal and Gog and Magog. That's right. So now we know that Gog and Magog are specially created by Allah to punish, to test and to punish. And that Akhirul Zaman or the last age is the age of the great imtihan. Imtihan means examination. We live in the age of the great examination. And this is an examination which if we fail, we go into the hellfire. So we must seek to pass the exam. In order to pass the exam, you must know the subject of Gog and Magog. And you must know the subject of Dajjal. And this is why tonight we address you on an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. And the best place to start is with the Jews. Because they know about Gog and Magog. The Arabs were puzzled. Here is someone who was born in our midst and we've known him all his life and he's always been so truthful, so honest, so trustworthy that we gave him the name Al-Amin and now at the age of 40 he declares that he is a prophet 
And the day is only one God. And he is the prophet of that one God. How can we tell whether or not this is a true claim? They decided to send a delegation to the city which is to the north of Mecca. The city of Yathrib, now it's called Medina. So a delegation went to that city to meet with the rabbis because the heart of the Jewish world had come there. In French they say, la creme de la creme, the best of the ulama were in that city. What were you doing there in Arabia? Hmm? They knew that someone was coming to that city and that's why they were there. So when the delegation went to Yatrib, now known as Medina, the rabbis said, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. And if he can answer them correctly, then he is indeed a prophet of the one God. If not, it's false. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. Ask him about the young men who fled to a cave and ask him about the Ruh. The Ruh is of course the spirit, but the Ruh is also Jibra'il alayhi salam, and the Ruh is also Allah's Ruh, because Allah says after he created the human being, وَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ after I had fashioned him, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And I have breathed into him of my ruh. فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ So prostrate yourself before him. Be talking to the angels. So Allah has a ruh. So this was the third question. And it was a tricky question. Uh, I have dealt with these three questions in my book entitled Surat al-Kaf in the Modern Age. Today, we will look at only one of the questions. Ask him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. And because we are dealing with geography of the Quran, we have the photographs to show you, inshallah. The answer to the question came down with Jibra'il alayhi salam and it is located in Surah Al-Kaf of the Quran. Surah Al-Kaf or the Surah of the Cave is the most important Surah in the Quran for explaining Akhirul Zaman or the last age. How would we know when we're living in the last age? Oh, there's plenty of evidence. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam came back from the Isra and Miraj. Do you remember? From my last lecture. Allah had shown him. لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى Allah showed him the greatest of his ayat. And so he came back to say about Akhirul Zaman that women would be dressed and yet naked. Is it already in the world? <laughs> Are we already living in Akhirul Zaman or the last age? He said that women will dress like men. Go to the bank and you'll see. 
in jackets and trousers and sometimes with a tie <laughs> it's happening already we are in Akhir Zaman and there is a mountain of evidence he's given to us by which we can recognize that we are indeed living in Akhir Zaman or the last age so Allah sent down in Surah Al-Kahf of the Quran information and knowledge and guidance pertaining to Akhir Zaman the whole Quran is important but when it comes to Akhir Zaman, this is the most important surah of the Quran, Surah al -Kep. And of course, you know that we have to recite it every day of Juma. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, don't worry. You must recite it every day of Juma. And if you do that, what will you get? Don't worry, Imam Shiraz, I'm not going to ask you. If you recite it on the day of Juma, what will you get? You get no, no, from the Samawat to the Ard, and that no will come and stay with you until the next Juma. And if you have no, you can see there are many in the world today, both in the Parliament and out of the Parliament who have eyes and yet can't see but if you have no in your heart you'll be able to see what otherwise cannot be seen so it is in this surah that we find the answer and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins his answer by saying and they question thee O Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam about the great traveler and he gives to the great traveler the title Dhul Karnain this is not a name Dhul Karnain is not a name Dhul Karnain is a title someone who has two two Karn Karnain two Karns Karn can mean a horn, so two horns. But Karn can also mean a generation, an epoch, an age, someone who impacts upon history twice. Twice. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرَى Allah says, I'm going to tell you something about him. And then he describes Zulkarnain as someone who has faith in Allah. And of course, you know that the truth came down to the world long before the Quran. So people in the world had faith long before Nabi Muhammad came. Not only did he have faith in Allah, but Allah established him on earth with power so power rests on the foundations of faith when power rests on the foundations of faith how is power used Allah gave him the capacity to pursue whatever goal he chose to pursue so he traveled in the direction of the setting of the sun meaning he's going west west you're going to see it soon inshallah and when he traveled west he came upon a body of water which was dark murky and there at that water's edge 
he came across a people who were resident there and then Allah said to him O Zulkarnay imma an tu'azziba wa imma an tattakhitha fihi musna how are you going to use power with the people are you going to punish or are you going to treat them nicely and reward them when power rests on the foundations of faith how is power used I think this lecture should be delivered in Parliament, don't you think so? Huh? Zulkarnain replied and said, Whosoever is an oppressor who is committing acts of zulum of injustice, of oppression. I will punish him. Meaning, power will be used to punish the oppressor. To teach him a lesson. But those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct, I will treat them nicely and reward them. But he also says something more about the ones who have conduct which is wicked, who are oppressors, unjust in their conduct. He says, when I am finished with them, they will return to you and you will also punish them. In other words, when power rests on the foundations of faith, there is a harmony between this world beneath and that world above. Good. Then he traveled in the opposite direction, in the direction of the rising of the sun. But he's traveling to the end of the land. And since the end of the land on this side was water, it would follow that the end of the land on that side has to be water. So he's traveling between two bodies of water. And this one on this side is dark and murky. So easy to identify. But on the same time, at the same time, we must also look for a body of water with a land mass and then another body of water on the other side. We're going to see it just now. <laughs> and there he came across a people. Sometimes the language of the Quran can be very, very difficult. I tell you, you'll crack your head with the difficulty. Because Allah uses so few words. So few words. He came across a people on the other side now. That's all. That's all. A people for whom we had provided nothing more. Nothing more as a covering. A people for whom we had provided nothing more, Minduni had other than it, as a covering. What does it mean? Is it that they are living a primitive way of life? And the only protection they have from the elements would be the primitive clothing, maybe. A people living the primitive way of life. Maybe Allah knows best. But Zulkardin, who has power, and whose power rests on the foundations of faith, had 
the good sense. He had the wisdom. He had the compassion. He had the integrity to leave these people to live undisturbed. That they have the right to live their way of life. And I should not use my power to destroy their primitive way of life. So when power rests on the foundations of faith, power will respect the way of life of even those who live a primitive way of life. Allah says, I understood. I understood how he responded to them. That's what the rabbis had asked for, the two journeys. But then Allah now responds with a third journey. <laughs> the rabbis didn't ask about it, but that's what they wanted to know. The third journey. Zulkarnay now travels in a third direction. And uh, there is a body of mountains stretching stretching from one end to the other and between this this range of mountains like the northern range there is a pass one solitary pass where people could pass through from that side to this side of the range of mountains we'll see it just now and there he came across a people لا يكادون يفقهون قولا لا يكادون يفقهون قولا A people whose language could not be understood. They spoke a unique language. A language which had no connections with the other languages in that region. Mm. So here is another clue by which we can recognize geographically where we are talking about. We look for a language which is unique, which is not connected with all the other languages in that region. After they had learned to communicate with each other, then these people said to him, Ya Zalkarnain, inna ya'juja wa ma'juja mufsiruna fil ab. O Zulkarnain, surely Gog and Magog are committing fasad in the land. What is fasad? Fasad is conduct which is evil in nature which corrupts and corrupts in such an extent, extent that it destroys that's facade so who can commit facade there are only three beings that Allah created he created human beings he created angels and he created jinn Angels do not commit sin. So Gog and Magog can't be angels. Can a jinn commit sin? Yes, a jinn can disobey Allah. So Gog and Magog can either be jinn or human beings. Nothing else. Nothing else. It can't be some creature with five dozen ears and ten dozen noses. Huh? Where has sense gone? I have to raise my voice in utter frustration 
because some people have just lost their capacity to think and no matter how much you try to teach them they remain where they are so kindly forgive me because I've been teaching this subject for more than 20 years now and my frustration is terrible so Gog and Magog have to be either human beings or jinn which one? nothing else in Allah's creation can commit facade human beings live on the earth you know any human being living one mile underneath the earth crawling like ants underneath the earth that's where human beings live where has sense gone human beings live on the earth so they ask Zulkarnay can you help us can you protect us from Gog and Magog can you build a barrier in this pass between the mountain sides because Gog and Magog are on the other side of the mountain and if you can build this barrier then we will be protected from them that's strange if Zulkarnain has power and he has declared to Allah and whosoever is wicked in their conduct I'll punish them well how how come he's not prepared to punish these people Gog and Magog why does he respond and agree to build the barrier answer because they're too powerful for him <laughs> because Nabi Muhammad والسلام, said it's a hadith al-Qudsi you know what is Hadith al-Qudsi, don't you? If you don't know Akshiraz, you know your Imam, Alhamdulillah. That Allah declared and said about Gog and Magog, I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So even Zulkarnain cannot destroy them. So he agrees to build the barrier. He said, they, prefer, they offered to pay him. He said, I don't need your money. No. Just bring me and help me with your manpower and bring me blocks of iron. Bring me blocks of iron. In Arabic, it is Hadid. But over here, Hadid is a fellow who has a store in Port of Spain. Hadith is iron. Bring me blocks of Hadith. I have to pause for a moment now for my students here who are serious students. That there is a surah of the Quran entitled Surah Al Hadid. Yes? And in that surah there is an ayah in which Allah says, Wa anzalna al Hadid. Wa anzalna al Hadid. And we sent down iron and steel. And Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, our learned teacher, points out in his book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, that iron was not a part of the original constitution of the earth. That iron came to the earth subsequently, perhaps through a meteorite which struck the earth. وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ In iron there is mighty power for war. وَمَنَافِعُ النَّاسِ And also greatly beneficial for human beings. So bring me blocks of iron. And when he had built the barrier, no, he said blow with your bellows because he has to have a furnace to melt the iron to block it. He says blow with your bellows and then he put molten copper on the wall or the they ask for a barrier or a wall a sud 
And he said, I'm going to build for you a radam, meaning a dam. Something like a dam which blocks the water from coming. And after he had built it, Gog and Magog could no longer pass through. There are his words. Has a rahmatum rabbi. This barrier which has been built is rahma from my Rabb, from my Lord God. They could neither penetrate the barrier nor could they go over the barrier. So we have to eliminate jinn. Why? <laughs> because a jinn could fly to the sky. So Gog and Magog cannot be angels and Gog and Magog cannot be jinn. Therefore Gog and Magog have to be human beings. They have to be human beings. Human beings who live on the earth, not underneath the earth, five miles underneath the earth. Only a dumb dumb will hold that view. You'll be surprised. Go and research and you see what kind of nonsense people believe in. Nabi Muhammad said about Gog and Magog. That Gog is an Ummah of Banu Adam. And Magog is an Ummah of Banu Adam. So human beings. And he says, none of them dies without leaving a thousand more behind. I will be happy. I will be happy if I can leave five more behind. Five. <laughs> to continue the work. Five. But none of them dies without leaving a hundred, a thousand more behind. When you look at the modern cell, cell cellular phone and the smartphone, you can know how they make the one thousand. Hmm? So now Gog and Magaga contained behind the barrier. He says, a rahmatum mi rabbi. Zulkarnain is speaking. This is my Lord's Rahma or kindness. For Isaja Awadu Rabbi, when that time comes, however, a wish my Lord God has won, Ja'alahu Dakka, Allah is going to bring down this barrier. Wakana Wadu Rabbi Hakka. And on that day the warning and the promise of my Lord God will be fulfilled. And Gog and Magog are going to be released into the world. And when they are released into the world, what's going to happen? It's going to be facade. They are so powerful, no one can stand up to them. Not even Saddam Hussein. That's how powerful they are. And they're going to corrupt the world. We leave the Surah to look at for a moment and we go to Surah to Anbiya because there are only two references in the whole Quran to Gog and Magog by name. The first one is the one I've just given you where the people said to Zulkarnain, O Zulkarnain, Gog and Magog, are committing facade in our land. Can you build a barrier to protect us? The second one is in Surah Al-Anbiya. And Allah speaks in Surah Al-Anbiya, which is Surah number 21. Surah Al-Kaf is Surah number 18. And Surah Al-Anbiya is Surah number 21. And He says, he speaks of a town. He destroyed the town. And having destroyed the town, he prohibited, he expelled the people and prohibited their return. You can come back as tourists, but you cannot come back 
to reclaim this town as your own. Which town is it? Hatta Iza futihat ya ajujo ma'jud Only when Allah brings down that barrier and Gog and Magog are released into the world, then وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ They are going to spread out in all directions. And with their indestructible power, they'll conquer the world. They'll take control of the world. It's going to be the world order of Gog and Magog. At that time, you will see these people who had been expelled from this town and banned from returning to reclaim it. At that time, you see these people being brought back to that town to reclaim it as their own. So now we know when Gog and Magog are released into the world, two things, watch out for them. Number one, a phenomenon of a new actor on the stage of history, on the stage of the world. But this bright, young, new actor has a power no one ever had before. No one could stand up to this new power. And this power does what no one has ever done before. They use their power to take control of the whole world. It never happened before in history. And they use their power not only to take control of the whole world, but to oppress. They will use power exactly the opposite way to Zulkarnain. They will use power to corrupt. They will use power to oppress. And they will use power to target those who have faith and who will live lives of righteousness. It doesn't matter whether he is Hindu or he is Christian or he is a Jew or he is Muslim or Buddhist. Once you are living a righteous life and you are holding on to faith, Gog and Magog are going to come after you. Hmm? So they are an essentially godless people. And they are a godless people who are going to take over the world. And after they have taken over the world with military conquest of the world, then they are going to bring these people back to the town from which the people had been expelled. this take place? When will Allah bring down the barrier? When will Gog and Magog be released? When will they spread out in all directions and conquer the world? When will they start to corrupt the whole world and destroy everything? And when will they bring these people back to this town? And which town is it? I want to pause now because these are very fascinating questions and I know you want to get the answers. So let us take a look at geography now for a little bit, little while. I have to now quote to you a hadith 
so that the geography of the subject will become clear. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam that when Gog and Magog are released, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee, which is in the Holy Land, Palestine, and start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they will say, there used to be water here. But after they pass the Sea of Galilee, they'll be going down to Jerusalem. At that time, Nabi Isa alayhi salam would have returned and he would have killed Dajjal. And Gog and Magog are attacking him, Nabi Isa alayhi salam. And he goes up a mountain. And the mountain is in Baytul Maqdis, which is Jerusalem. Baytul Maqdis is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is also known as Al-Quds. The Quran doesn't have English in it. So you won't find the name Jerusalem in the Quran. So they're passing the Sea of Galilee, going down to Jerusalem. And then they surround the mountain. And Nabi Isa al-Islam is on the mountain. And they will say, we have killed those who are on earth. Now let us kill those who are in the sky above. And they send their arrows up into the sky. And Allah will cause the arrows to come back down with blood. Hmm? So it looks like Star Wars, eh? Star Wars. So now... Here is the Holy Land over here. And uh, the Sea of Galilee is somewhere here. And uh, Jerusalem is somewhere here. There's Jerusalem. So if the Sea of Galilee is to the north of Jerusalem, they have to be coming down this way. If they're going to pass by the Sea of Galilee to reach to Jerusalem. So Gog and Magog are coming from this direction, coming down. First lesson in geography. Second lesson in geography. To the left, of this area, there is one big body of water, and that's the Mediterranean Sea. But the visibility in the Mediterranean Sea is good. You could see a few meters down. Let's go to number two, see? Ah, here we are. Go back, go back, let's see. Go back. Yeah, the first one. Here. Come, bring it. Ah, right, there we are. Bring this way. Can you bring it this way? No? Oh, yeah, here we are. Sorry. Correct. This is the Mediterranean Sea here. And the visibility is excellent. But to the left of this land is another body of water and the visibility is so bad that it is called the Black Sea so you don't need a PhD to know that Allah is talking about the Black Sea when he says Ainun Hamia so when Zulkarnin travel in the direction of the setting of the sun, he was going this way, this way to the Black Sea. Couldn't be the Mediterranean Sea, it had to be the Black Sea. And when he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, he goes to the other end of the land, it has to be the 
Caspian Sea. So between here and here, there should be mountains. Are there mountains between here and there? Yes. What are they called? The Caucasus Mountains. And they start from here and they go to here. And between this mass of mountains, there is only one pass. Let's go. Next one. Okay. Ah, here we are. There are the mountains. See? There are the mountains. <laughs> and this is where Zulkarnain went in the direction of the setting of the sun. And this is where he came, the direction of the rising of the sun. And between this are the Caucasus Mountains. Whole range of mountains. Do you see the brown color? Do you see the brown color? That's mountains. Good, next one. Here we are. This is the one pass, one, between the mountains. This is, it's called <laughs> Dariel Pass. And when Russia was taken over by the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union built a military highway. This photograph was taken before that military highway was built. They built a military highway through this pass, okay? From one side of the mountain to the other side, which means, Sharad, I'm sure you'll agree, the barrier gone, huh? The barrier gone. We had some people from La Romaine. Their son went to study medicine over there. And when the father and mother went to visit their son, they went right here. And they looked, they see no barrier. <laughs> it's no longer there. But you don't have to travel all the way to check, you know. Now they have something called the internet, and they have something called Google Earth. And you could check out even a square inch, you could see the whole earth is photographed. No barrier, next one. Here again is the pass. This is the pass where Zulkanin built a barrier made of iron and steel all across it. Next one. Okay. The Quran says about that pass that the two sides of the pass were like the sides of a shell. That's how. Sadafain, the sides of a shell. This is the shape of the pass, the shell. Next one. Here is the Dariel pass again. Hmm? Again, next one. Again, the Dariel Pass. Go ahead. Okay. Here's the Sea of Galilee. And where's Jerusalem? Where's Jerusalem? Somewhere around there is Jerusalem. Oh, this is a very old map. Very old map. But the Sea of Galilee here, and Jerusalem is way down there. Next one. Okay, now you can see the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and they're coming this way to the Holy Land. Nabi Muhammad is asleep. at the home of his wife, Zainab, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he has a vision. He sees something. And he wakes up from his sleep, and his face is flushed 
red. Whatever he saw was so terrible. And he woke up to declare, Wailul lil Arab, woe unto the Arabs. Min sharrin kadik taraba, because of a great evil which is now close. When he raised his hands like this, and he said, today, a hole has been made in the barrier of Zulkarnain. So Gog and Magog are now being released in the lifetime of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. And when they are released, that's bad news for the whole world. But that is worse news for the Arabs. Because Gog and Magog are going to attack the Arabs more than everybody else. She asked, who? Zainab, radiallahu Will we be destroyed, we Arabs, even though there are righteous people amongst us, will we be destroyed? Hadith is Sahih Bukhari. Yeah? He said, Naam. Yes, the Arabs are going to be destroyed. When? Either Kathur al Khabas when rubbish prevails. And the first place and the most important place you look for rubbish is not in parliament. <laughs> no, not in the market. No. The people who are supposed to maintain a society, to be the guides of a society, of a community, to protect the community from going into the garbage bin, are the scholars, the ulama. So when the ulama fail, when the ulama have a status as garbage, as rubbish, at that time you will see the Arabs being destroyed, either Kathur al Khabas. So now we know that Gog and Magog are released in the lifetime of the Prophet. So now we can understand what is happening in history since then. But what about that town? Which town is it? Is there a town which is linked with Gog and Magog? Yes, there is. Because when they pass the Sea of Galilee, they're going down to Jerusalem. There is only one town that is connected with Gog and Magog. It's not Chicago. It's Jerusalem. So when Allah says about a town which he destroyed and expelled the people of the town and placed a ban on them that they could never return to reclaim that town as their own, he's talking about Jerusalem. The Jews were expelled from Jerusalem. And for 2,000 years, they could not return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. Allah gave us minds with which to think. And mashallah, we have people who think. But the more you watch television, the less you can think. And when you think you're doing your children a favor by putting them in front of the TV and by giving them the smartphone, what you're doing is destroying their capacity to think. Tomorrow, we'll only have robots out there. You could talk as much as you want. Then I'm going to listen to you because they are being taken over, their minds are being taken over. And you will have to answer to Allah for that. 
less and less people in the world today have a capacity to think. And I have lost hope now for parliament. They can't think out there. No. <laughs> the town is Jerusalem. The Jews were expelled from Jerusalem. For 2,000 years, they could not return to reclaim it as their own. But then came a new actor on the stage of the world with a scientific and technological revolution which when applied to military technology gave them unprecedented military power unprecedented industrial power and they use that power with wars of colonization to colonize the whole world and to force the submission of the whole world to them they were the ruling power in the world and when they took over the world they started to corrupt the whole world so that today if you look around the world and you have eyes with which to see you will say yesterday was better yesterday was cleaner yesterday was purer and today it's like rubbish and then we saw these people taking control of the world in the world order of Gog and Magog and we saw them bringing the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own and then a state of Israel was born in the Holy Land and this happened just yesterday this happened in our lifetime those who brought the Jews back to the Holy Land the Gog and Magog Gog and Magog there is another way by which we can recognize them. But as Allah has said in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tattakhizu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya, ba'aduhum awliya wa ba'ad. O you who have faith in Allah, do not take such Jews, and do not take such Christians, as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other and whosoever from amongst you turn to them with friendship and alliance you don't belong to us anymore you belong to them in Allah surely Allah does not provide guidance for a wicked people and so one part of the Christian world and one part of the Jewish world reconcile and make friendship and alliance and this is called the Western Christianity and the Western Judaism and it is a Zionist movement which brought about this alliance and the Vatican is at the heart of it so when we talk about Gog and Magog, we're talking about the West. That is it. We're talking about the Western world. We're not talking about Russia, because Russia is not a part of the West. We're not talking about China, because China is not a part of the West. No. We're talking about Russia didn't bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. No, the Soviet Union did it, not Russia. And the Soviet Union, quite different from Russia. Russia never invaded Afghanistan. You're a schoolboy if you say that. Russia never invaded Afghanistan. If you say that, you're a schoolboy. Did you hear me? It is the Soviet Union which invaded Afghanistan. No, not, not Russia. But I have some critics, oh my gosh. I don't know. Everything I say, they, they, they challenge me. Every, every, everything I say. 
And so now we have identified Gog and Magog. And now it's time for me to wrap up with, of course, the most important hadith of all. Before that, we can mention that Gog and Magog are thirsty. They'll drink up all the water of the world. They will pass by a river and drink it dry, said Nabi Muhammad They will drink the whole of the Sea of Galilee, make it dry. So when you see the water level going down, down, down around the world. Yesterday this was a river in Santa Cruz. And you could jump from the bridge and dive into the water. Today, if you dive, you could break your head. You don't have no water left. <laughs> that, that's Santa Cruz. That's Santa Cruz. The great lakes of Canada. And now they have to have new routes for ships to navigate. Why? Because the le level of water is going down so much that you have to have a new route to navigate. The great lakes of Canada. Many rivers and many lakes in the world are drying up today. A sign that we are living in the age of Gog and Magog. What about the Sea of Galilee? When the Sea of Galilee is dry, no more water, we know that Nabi Isa Islam would already have come into the world. What is the water level now? I'm not going to tell you. You go and do this. You go and do the research and check it out. What is the water level in the Sea of Galilee now? Hmm? Let us go now to the last hadith, the one that I quoted in my last lecture here. The one that terrifies us. Hadith al Qudsi. If you don't know what's a hadith of Qudsi, ask Shiraz, Imam Shiraz. It is Yawmul Qiyamah, sorry, Yawmul Deen, the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Adam alayhi salam. And he said, this is Sahih Bukhari, repeated four times in Sahih Bukhari. He says to Adam alayhi salam, take out or separate the people for Jahannam. Adam alayhi salam asks, how many are they, O Allah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replies and says, out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet والسلام, were terrified when they heard that. He smiled. He said, good news for you. The one for Jannah will be from you. Meaning, a people who faithfully follow the true religion. But then he went on to say that the 999 will all belong to the Jamaat of Gog and Magog. Ahlu ya Juj wa Majuj. So it doesn't matter whether you are Muslim, or you are Christian, or you are Jew, or you are Hindu, or you are Noarian. You all belong to one Jamaat. The Jamaat of Gog and Magog. And you live essentially one way of life. One way of life. And that one way of life will take you all into the hellfire. The only one, the only one who will survive is the one who separates himself from the global society. To separate yourself from the global society is not easy. No. And that is why our prophet said, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. I mean, people are not going to be happy with me, you know, for telling, teaching this. <laughs> he says in Akhir zaman holding on to Islam will be like holding on to, what? Yeah. Hot coals. Hot 
course, now you just use gas stove, you don't use chula anymore. <laughs> For a long time, my mother used to use the coal pot. And the coal pot, you have coals. So we know what is hot coals. How can you hold a hot coal in your hand? It's very difficult. He said, holding on to Islam will be like holding on to hot coals. That is how difficult it will be to separate yourself from the Jamaat of Gog and Magog, which is the global society being built before our eyes today, which is all going into the hellfire. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless those who now with the restlessness in their hearts devote the time and attention sincerely and earnestly and seriously to study the subject. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samiul alim wa tub alayna ya mawlana inna ka inta tawwabur rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin alim.